All right, welcome everyone. My name is Leslie Friday and I'm the Director of Content on the Marketing and Communications team here at Partners in Health. And I have the great pleasure to be sitting with um, some amazing folks today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Paul Farmer and John Green, both of which I'll introduce uh, very shortly with a little, little bio. Um, but welcome to the Power of Partnership, a discussion today with Paul and, and John, um, who are great partners here at, at the organization. And um, before we dive into what promises to be a really great chat, I wanna give some information to folks who are joining us and maybe not quite used to Zoom yet. So if you toggle up to the front you'll see, or to the top of the screen, you'll see view options and you'll want to do the side-by-side -side mode. So choose that. And then if you look at the far right side of the screen, there are vertical parallel bars there. You can move them left to right to increase the size of the screen or, or decrease it. Um, this entire meeting will be recorded today. So if you know of folks who are interested in attending but just couldn't make the time, there will be an opportunity to watch the entire event. Um, it'll be posted on our uh, webinar site on pih.org. So you can check it out there. Um, if you are interested in looking at closed captions, you'll see on the lower right-hand side, there's a live transcript. So you can just click on that button and choose the option that works best for you. Um, all right, so without further ado, uh, let's, let's get uh, chatting. So today we have Dr. Paul Farmer here with us. And uh, Paul is our chief strategist and co-founder of Partners in Health. He's also Cola Catrones University Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard University. Welcome, Paul. It's always it's great. Leslie. Happy <laughs> Giving Tuesday. Happy Giving Tuesday. This is your favorite day. day of the year. It is. It's, it's marked on my calendar at home. And John Green, great to have you here. John is a PH partner, best-selling author, and one half of the Blog Brothers with his brother, Hank Green. So welcome, John. Thank you. It's so nice to be with you today, Leslie. Thanks for thanks for doing this. Happy Giving Tuesday. Happy Giving Tuesday. Um, and uh, today, if if uh, the title slide didn't clue you in, we're going to be talking about partnership and its potential to really transform the landscape of global health. So um, let's let's dive in. Kind of uh, just to give people a lay of the land, we'll have some questions and a discussion with Paul and John for about. 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, there have been some excellent pre-submitted questions, and please feel free to drop your questions in the chat, which um, we will see on the back end. You might not see um, on your side. So uh, first up here, uh, Paul, what comes to mind when you think about partnership? We talk about partnership. It's in our title, right, for a good reason. And uh, what are the key tenets of partnership that you aim to carry out in the work that Partners in Health does every day? Well, you know, partnership uh, isn't valuable unless it's linked to a valuable goal. So, I mean, I, I couldn't, so let me, let me put it two ways. Partnership isn't value unless it's linked to a valuable goal. And I can't imagine a goal that's more important than the one we're pursuing. And, th and then just to say a bit more, I also know from long experience that you know, you take a pandemic or an epidemic, can you really stop an epidemic without focusing on inequalities and social disparities? You'd be hard pressed, I think, to find one that ended in any humane way where people didn't think about the poor, the marginalized, the downtrodden, just the sick. So to me, it, partnership is the necessary, uh, and it's not just me, of course, it's a necessary precondition to making a difference in a world driven by poverty and equality and all kinds of bad things. So that's what it, it spells for me, but I can think of a million specific examples where, you know, in our work delivering medical care, where partnership was crucial to the outcome of a you know, particular patient. In fact, most patients. So I don't know, I feel like we're swimming in it. It's the only way out of troubles and there are enormous rewards. Like if you had, if, if you had said to me uh, 10 years ago, that I would get to be uh, friends with John and Hank and their families, you know, I, I think I would have said, it wouldn't surprise me because even if I don't know them now, that partnership has so much promise. And the biggest yield beyond the meeting the goal is, is making new friends who share those objectives with you. Anyway, I have an elaborate justification, Leslie, 
but it's really, uh, it, to me, it just means the work. Partnership is how you get the work done. Yeah. And John, I want to pull you to the conversation too, to tell us a little bit about the connection, right? Some people might not know about your personal journey, you know, to partners in health. So tell us a little bit about that. And then what aspects of our work um, appro and approach align with your beliefs, uh, how you think about how the world should work? Yeah, I mean, for me, it does start with a, a foundation in collaboration and a belief in uh, partnership and, and collaboration across, you know, all, all, all kinds of disparities. But uh, yeah, my brother and I grew up in a house where both our parents worked for nonprofit organizations. My dad's, most of my dad's careers with the Nature Conservancy. My mom was and still is a, a community activist. And so it was something that was, you know, it was expected of us from the time we had income that part of that money would go to, uh, to charitable organizations. But I think when, for both Hank and me, you know, when we were younger, we responded to what we saw. Um, we responded, if a story was in the news, we tried to respond to that story. If, if we found out about something, we tried to respond to that thing. And, it, and in some ways that was good. And in other ways, it led to this sort of uh, frantic, oh my God, there are so many problems in so many directions. What makes real change? You just want to, you want to do something, but you don't know what to do. And it was really when uh, Hank and I read um, Partners in Health co-founder Ophelia Dahl's observation that long-term problems require long-term solutions, that we began to start to think differently about it, um, and that we began to understand that when it comes to making generational change, we need to leverage a lot of resources and distribute those resources to the places where they aren't right now, and that that's, a, that's, that's the work of generations. Um, just like creating these inequities, these inequities are not natural, they're not inevitable. That was also the work of generations. Impoverishment was the work of, of generations. And so that's where it began for us, um, was in, in understanding that if we wanted to see long-term change, we were going to have to pay attention to systems and how systems get built and how fragile systems get stronger over time mm -hmm. through investment and broad partnerships. And you know, obviously, Hank and I are a tiny, tiny piece of that puzzle, but but every piece is important. Yeah, I think what I find really interesting too, uh, John, about your work is that you you get the systems part right. It's not just the one thing; it's the entire yeah. package. Yeah, I mean, that was part of the you know when we were starting to think about giving, we were thinking about either or, you know, either water or electricity, either ambulances or clinics. And PIH's model is, is both and, and really the story of systems is both and. These are systemic challenges. Like the problem of healthcare access, healthcare inequity globally is a systemic problem. And you just aren't gonna fix it with one solution or another, it has to be, a systemic intervention. And that's why we were so, I mean, that's, we, we've seen PIH do that work for decades um, with, with government partners, with, lot, with other NGOs, with lots of partners, but seeing it up close over the last couple of years through the development of the Maternal Center of Excellence has been really inspiring for me. And this is a project in Sierra Leone, building a maternal care center and, and NICU at Coyote Government Hospital. And it's not just about, it's really profoundly not just about donors and really not just about um, even the all the healthcare workers who will be trained at KGH because of this. It's about the community. And, you know, PIHers have, have been in the community in Koidu for, you know, many years and have really built up a sense of trust. And you can't get that in one day. And that's been really inspirational to see as well. If I could just add, pick up on that, Leslie, you know, um, John mentioned the word trust and, you know, you kick this off with, by asking about partnership. And one of the most commented uh, upon phenomena that we saw in 2014 and after during the, during the years of the Ebola outbreak was just the enormous toll taken by a lack of trust. And, you know, is that merely a cultural phenomenon or a psychological or emotional one? Of course not, it's related to material conditions, 
Like, why would you trust a health system that uh, all but ensured that so many women would die in childbirth, you know? And so the, the work of the Maternal Center of, Center of Excellence or whatever it ends up getting called in the end is really building on that trust, which is building on the partnership, which was launched in the middle of a crisis. And, and, it, and I would also add that that's another thing about partnership. It gets tested in crisis. And, you know, if, if you get through those tests, and maybe it's an earthquake, maybe it's a, a, a terrible outbreak of Ebola or cholera or something else, but, you know, it, this is cumulative, right? And so that's another great thing about partnership. If it's linked to accompaniment, meaning long-term open-ended commitments, then you get to see this trust grow over time. And the problems that you saw, let's say in the case of Sierra Leone in 2014, they get to be a different set of problems. You know, right in that year, we're dealing with Ebola, food insecurity, even violence. Uh, and as the years go by, obviously the needs of the population change as well. And if there's accompaniment involved, you'll be, you know, remaining flexible to, to meet the changing needs of the population. You know, I, I was teaching this morning uh, at Harvard and, you know, I, I had a little epiphany about Partners in Health during the comments from someone else, another physician. And she was, and she's an, another academic physician, actually. And she was saying, I mean, can you imagine having an AIDS program where your hypertensive AIDS patients are treated for HIV disease, but not their hypertension? And I just, I didn't say anything out loud, but I just thought we would never do that at Partners in Health. And why would we never do that? Because we have partners like John and Hank, but what about Tom White? You know, Tom White uh, back in the 80s, you know, he was a founder of Partners in Health and readily available to us and accompanying us. And we'd say, what do you think about that, Tom? Imagine giving someone treatment for a malignancy, but ignoring their hypertension. So that he helped us launch his own trust in us really is why, you know, we've grown into what we are today and what we'll grow into tomorrow. That's partnership. Talk about one of the original partners, right? Uh, right there, um, and wonderfully benevolent. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned the Maternal Center of Excellence, John and, and Paul, because I wanted to talk about that a little bit. We broke ground in the spring, big event. Paul, you were there. You helped lay the first bricks. Um, could you talk a little more about how PIH identified this need, and uh, you know, in Sierra Leone specifically? Um, and how PIH worked with partners like John to, to make this a reality. Maybe Paul, if you don't mind. Sure, I mean, um, you know, we went into Sierra Leone knowing full well, because, you know, after all, this was 2014. Um, and you'd be saddened if we didn't, haven't learned a lot of lessons uh, in other settings. So we, we went in there, not with the confidence because we battled Ebola before, but we have irrigated medical deserts uh, again and again, and always seen it work, you know, things flourish when you water them in a medical desert. So we didn't need to go to Sierra Leone to know that they needed the equivalent of a maternal center, center of excellence, or maybe four or five of them, right? Not to scare you, John, we're not saying we're going <laughs> to meet all those needs, but you didn't have to go there because the, the data, uh, you know, at the end of the civil war in Sierra Leone, which happened only a decade, after, uh, before Ebola came to pass, you know, Sierra Leone was already the country with the lowest life expectancy at birth, probably with the highest maternal mortality ratio. But within a couple of years after that, it started gaining a grim renown as having the highest maternal mortality ratio. So, you know, you could bump into kids at a school of public health somewhere who had never been to Sierra Leone and they might know that. So we know going, go, going in, that the system was broken. I gave a, a talk with Sheila Davis today. She said the healthcare system was broken. It was, and parts of it had never been built to be broken and it didn't exist yet. So we went in knowing we would stay and work on health system strengthening and what better thing to focus on than uh, maternal mortality. Not because you're only interested in pregnant women, you're interested in all women and girls and everybody else, but because in order to address maternal mortality, especially on a systems level, you have to have a system that reaches all the way from people's homes into clinics and hospitals and is linked together so that someone has a complication. First of all, it's not a good idea to have a baby at home in a place like that. 
So almost all of the home-based delivery deliveries in there, but the majority are done because there are no other safer options. And recourse to a traditional birth attendant, it's not that we don't wanna work with the traditional birth attendants, it's we want them to be equipped and safe and able to protect themselves and to protect these babies and the moms. So we knew going in that if there's a good report card on a health system, it's probably maternal mortality. And the fact that Sierra Leone had the highest meant for us that it also had the worst health system. Because there you need to have things like blood banking, surgeons, electricity 24 seven, again, in a referral system. Sierra Leone had none of those things, not even in the capital city. That, that's another shocker. You know, you go to the maternal uh, hospital in the capital city, it's also bereft of these necessary things, including the referral system. So we knew where to start going in and nothing we learned in that first year, even though we were busy addressing Ebola, nothing we learned in that year made us think that it was not a problem that would be worsened uh, during Ebola, but also after, because what was Ebola, who was Ebola taking out? Skilled health professionals and traditional healers, including traditional birth attendants, especially traditional birth attendants. So over the course of that epidemic, maybe a thousand health professionals died in those three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And that meant that there would be even more work to rebuild or to build for the first time the health system. And that's where we are, but we've gotten a lot done over the last few years, even before breaking ground on the new center. How did I do, Leslie? Was that? You did a fantastic job. Wasn't okay. concise, but. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that pro I, I just want to highlight an example of that progress really quickly, which is that just uh, in 2020, which was obviously a very difficult year to deliver medical care, including uh, at KGH, where parts of the hospital had to close, due to COVID for a time, um, child mortality, under five mortality at the hospital went down by 50% because of a new special baby care unit and the incredible work of Isada Dumbaya and all of her colleagues um, on the maternal and child health team at KGH. And that's before the Maternal Center of Excellence. Now, like there's still a very long way to go. I don't wanna pretend otherwise, but I think that highlights how dramatic the change can be. And I'm glad you jumped in there too, John, because you know this particular project, you've really marshaled uh, and and explained in a way that is understandable and compelling to people who are are your fans, right? Um, so, can you explain a little bit more about what excited you about this particular project, and how do you get people? How do you convince people in your milieu, right, to to join? Yeah, I mean, I think. That what excited us about the project is that it was where the experts had identified an immediate need and an immediate opportunity. Um, we are not experts, and we have to remember all the time that we're not experts. Uh, there are things that I'm good at um, knowing how to would systemically address global health inequities is not an area of my expertise. So I think like that's important to remember. So like we went when we went when we came to PIH, we said, what, what do you need? We wanted to come from a place of listening rather than a place of instructing. And that's certainly something I learned from my parents. I think um, growing up, you know, with, with development professionals in the household, um, we wanted, so we wanted to begin from a place of listening. And what PIH said to us was when we look at the opportunity to strengthen uh, healthcare systems, we see this immediate, you know, really, acute need in uh, Sierra Leone centered around maternal and child mortality, but you can't, you know, the, the, the ways that the healthcare will be strengthened by this project will not reach only people giving birth or only children under five, it will reach everyone. As, as Paul said, like, you know, a, a blood bank is good for everyone. Surgical suites are good for everyone, more trained nurses and doctors, that's, that's good for everyone. Um, and so that's we saw that systemic opportunity, and we uh, we trusted PIH to you know to know how to do this well and know how to build the right partnerships to to get it done effectively and efficiently. And so that's that's where we started in terms of communicating that. You know, we we have the benefit of not having a relationship with our audience that only extends for like 20, you know, like 
five minutes every week or, or whatever, that, but that in many cases has extended over many years. And to go back to the earlier point about trust, I think there was a lot of trust built up over those years among all of us. And so when it came time to try to talk about system strengthening, which is not as fun to talk about, like it's a lot more fun to be able to say like, we're going to buy an ambulance and that ambulance is going to do so much good. We're going to build this building and that building is going to be so amazing. We're going to hire this doctor and this doctor is going to be so great. We're going to buy all these bed nets. And that's not to take anything away from ambulances or bed nets or any of that, because it's all super important. You know, bed nets have certainly saved a lot of lives. But when, you know, when I was in Kono, I saw many ambulances with broken axles that couldn't be fixed. And so if you don't strengthen the whole system, you end up with a lot of broken ambulances and broken telecommunications equipment and everything else. So in terms of communicating it to them, we tried to focus on that. We tried to focus on, look, this isn't as easy. This isn't as simple or as straightforward as like, you know, buying, you know, sponsoring a, a building or whatever, but it is really important and it's what ultimately leads to the kinds of generational change that, that we want to see. And that in some cases we have, have seen over the last 25 years. So we tried to focus on times this has worked, the acuteness of the need and the importance of paying attention to the actual system over a long term. And this next question too, I, I love this. This is really great. Um, but this question is for both of you. So how can partnership like this help to transform global health? And uh, just looking at some questions that were previously submitted, you know, in particular, I think this is important during a pandemic, right? Well, finally, some people, we might've been saying the same message we have been, right, Paul, for 30 years yeah. and then some, but now this is resonating in a different way. So how can this type of partnership really be transformational and Paul, if you want to take it first. Yeah, then... Well, I mean, I, I think if we if we seize the moment, you know, and, and go back to, you know, John's description of the passage of time. I mean, it's not like time is only static. Things change all, all the time and they change at the same time and varied times. But, you know, I, I think that we're living, when you're living in a pandemic and you know, for us, we're accustomed to epidemics and even paying attention to pandemics. Like HIV is a pandemic, but when you're living in, in a pandemic of a respiratory affliction, uh, it's not the case that everyone is at risk. That's another still a fiction as with other, like Ebola. It's not like everybody's gonna get Ebola, you know, or AIDS or hepatitis C or whatever, right? Uh, but there's an idea that if it's an airborne infection, well, everybody's going to get it or anybody can get it. That's still not true, right? COVID attracts along social disparities in through different mechanisms, but as reliably as Ebola or HIV or, or cholera. The thing that's really struck me just as a human living through this time, as we all are, is that there's more discussion in more places about the kind of things we talk about all the time at Partners in Health, by our at Partners in Health, I don't mean an office like, like this one, but in the sense of the community that John described, he and Hank having created. We have that community too, John and Hank are in it and their families. And you know, we talk about this stuff all the time. We talk about the need for a safety net, the need for unemployment insurance, the need for emergency medical services that anyone can access at any time they have an emergency, national health insurance programs, all these desiderata that we have to see people flourish on this earth that are very much shut out of possibility in, in many settings, including those that need them most, the United States, Sierra Leone among them, that has led up. And now we're hearing people talk about these things that we have ardently desired, you know, for others and for ourselves too, but for others particularly. And so I think there is this moment where we should drive forward some real concrete victories. Uh, and, and that can sometimes be flagship projects like the Maternal Center of, of Excellence. I mean, if the earthquake hadn't happened in Haiti in 2010, we would not have University Hospital by 2013. And if the we didn't have hospital uh, University Hospital, this is in Haiti, by 2013, when the next earthquake hit on August 14th, 2021, we would not have had five cohorts of emergency physicians who had graduated from university hospital. And when I got to the earthquake zone this last time, there they were leading teams, mostly young women, by the way, 
uh, all having gone through this kind of training that getting back to John's point takes a long time and Ophelia's point, it, it's a long-term commitment. You know, I spent decades in school, right? So why would we assume that you could train someone to be a good obstetrician in 15, you know, in, in a weekend? So we see these openings now, we have to seize them, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm optimistic about it myself. Yeah, I think the other thing that, you know, you can do on a pretty small scale, I, and, and I think this is something that Partners in Health has done from the beginning, is make the case, make the case that we don't have to live in this world, make the case that we don't have to accept uh, the, the kinds of profound impoverishment that have been created by colonialism and its relics, make the case that we don't have to accept a world where uh, people, even in ostensibly very wealthy countries, cannot um, access healthcare. And, you know, PIH has made that case by treat, you know, being one of the first uh, groups to prove that MDRTB can be treated in so-called low resource settings by making the case that HIV treatment is not something that should be reserved only for rich people or for people uh, living in, in rich countries. And, and that has had a huge ongoing impact. I mean, a, a huge, huge impact in the story of global health over the last 30 years. Now, again, like the the the, the size of the problem com relative to the to the amount of resources being um, you know sent its direction is there's a complete incompatibility there, right? Like, you know, the, the a study just came out a couple of days ago talking about the disability adjusted life years lost as, associated with tuberculosis, and it's just mind boggling. I mean, it's just it's astonishing that a disease that most of us never worry about, or you know, mo most of the people watching this, many of the people watching this will never worry about getting is killing over a million people a year. Many of them children, um, almost all of them in, in, you know, who, who, who don't have to die. And I find that in, infuriating and, and at times it can make me also feel pretty powerless, but, um, as Paul always says, it's true that resources are limited, but they have never been uh, less limited than they are right now. And so we need to respond to that. We need to respond to these inequities appropriately. Amen. Yes, and I think that's a good transition over to our, our question. So there are just a wonderful group of questions coming in and I have some great uh, pre-submitted questions. So I'm going to to offer some up to you here now. Um, and I, I'll just say your name before we go on to each question so you know who is going to get which one. But uh, a lot of people wanted to know um, how people can partner with us and support the work beyond donating. So there are folks who are infectious disease experts or they're entering the medical field, or they're retired physicians. Um, how can they make an impact in uh, global health equity locally, globally. Paul, you look pensive. Well, you know, um, I'm going to try and stick with some of the principles that, you know, John and I have been discussing. But first, let me just say that, uh, as Jim Kim used to say, it's not, not a long line of people waiting to address these problems, even though there are many more now than there were when Jim said that, right? So, and, and I'm thinking of a of a, call, a comment from a colleague of mine, uh, you know, which was rendered in a rather severe fashion, a Haitian leader, one of our, our leaders. Um, someone was saying, hey, um, do you think you could use, and then they said something, I don't know, desalination plant, or maybe it was hospital beds. Who, and, and, and my colleague said, don't feel too free to turn down something offered on my behalf. And, you know, I took that to heart and I've seen others do it, right? Because it's, a, it, it's, it's difficult to find the docking station or whatever the term might be, you know, to integrate. But if you have that patience of accompaniment, if you have that commitment that John laid out that it's important, then it's hard for me to imagine, <coughs> excuse me, a barrier to anyone participating in this work, a librarian, you know, a manager, uh, but definitely a physician or a nurse. Now, there are certain times where we've had openings for people to, in responding to an emergency, the example 
of Haiti after the big earthquake, we said, look, we want people with uh, surgical skills, and that means nurses, surgical nurses, emergency room doctors, anesthesiologists. We wanted people with a certain kind of skill because we were in Port-au-Prince in the earthquake zone and saw the, the nature of the injuries. Uh, and you know, we had a lot of people get involved in our work at that point. And the, the ones who are most motivated are still involved, right? In the response to Ebola, we were looking again for people quite skilled in responding to emergencies, you know, and what we wouldn't have given for a whole bunch of IV nurses, people who do that all day long, but we had enough. So uh, in addition to those, you know, occasional openings, meaning they're occasioned by an uh, a, a emergency of some sort, um, we just have to get keep getting better at growing the family and finding new ways to bring in people because when we start declining uh you know efforts of uh that are important to someone else just because we don't need them or find them inconvenient that would mean that we're not playing the function we should as connectors between between those who have some skill or something to offer and the need and of course in the united states it's the same story i'm not talking about some far away place uh, I'm talking about on the globe. That's what global health is supposed to be about. So that's why there's so many people from PIH working in Alabama. Someone wrote in from Birmingham just now in Immokalee, Florida, in Newark, New Jersey, in the American Southwest, obviously with the Navajo as we have been privileged to do. But it's the need is everywhere. The question is, how are we gonna seize the moment to you know, grow that family? Yeah, yeah and I always say to people who can't, um afford to donate right now that if that that your attention is extraordinarily valuable like in some ways it's the only you know it's like our only thing it's the only thing we have is is how we you know choose to to spend our our, our days and so i think paying attention in an in an ongoing way to the, your own to the healthcare system in your in your backyard certainly i mean that's something that's a big focus for for sarah and me but also to the world's healthcare system the ways that it's getting stronger the ways it's getting more fragile is hugely valuable and then who knows someday you might be in a position to donate um and 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 if you are you will be that much more uh informed and and engaged but ultimately like i i think that uh, you know, generosity happens when we make ourselves, uh, when we allow ourselves to be proximal to suffering. Uh, there's a reason why people will go to extraordinary lengths to save someone who is drowning, even if that person is a stranger. You know, most people will not just try to help, but they will take risks to try to help. Um, and that is because we we see it and and we can choose to look away from the suffering that's all around us or or we can see it. Yeah, that's so great. I think, you know, John, you being also a creative, right, a, a writer, um, an author, using that talent to educate people about the situations is, is equally, you know, it's yeah. all part of the mix. And I will personally take advantage of the Giving Tuesday moment and saying, if you are able to donate, please do consider that at whatever amount at ph.org. If you're from Canada, there is phcanada.org. Uh, so please do um, think about that. But if you're not in that position, you can also, as John said, keep informed and sign up for information and e-newsletters through PIH.org uh, or advocate, uh, sign petitions. So those are other opportunities. Next question I want to mm -hmm. offer up to both of you. Um, what advice would you give to those just entering the field of global health um, in college or, or medical school? Anything that they should be I guess, keeping in mind, Paul? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I, teach, under, I teach global health uh, to undergrads, which not for my whole teaching career, which has largely been in hospitals, but for the past dozen or so years. And that's what I was doing this morning. Um, and so I'm going to give you a considered answer, the, ones, the one that we give to our own students here and in Haiti and Rwanda. It's amazing to me how rarely people find the time, and I understand it's about time, to understand more about the context in which they're working or a context in which they have even passing interests. That requires two things, to understand any context. Like if I go to Sierra Leone, 
the first thing I want to jettison on my first trip, and then for the next hundred or so trips, I want to jettison the idea that I could ever gain cultural competence. It's much better going with this notion of cultural humility, because anybody can have that and just say, you know, I don't know enough about this place to, uh, to not be around my, my accompaniateurs who are Sierra Leonean, people like Byler Berry, uh, and many others, Isatu was named as well. I don't have that cultural competence. So I have two things I'm gonna do on top of my work, whatever that, that may be. And again, to some of the questions in the chat, maybe the work is management, maybe the work is scheduling, maybe the work is maintenance, maybe it's not clinical at all, you know? So I have to do two things. One, to look around and understand the context. That's actually an area uh, of study called anthropology, which is why I took a PhD in anthropology, because I wanted to learn how to be better at understanding contemporary context. But anthropology often gives short shrift to history. So to understand the history, and John said something really important earlier uh, about, you know, how did these horrible disparities come to be? After all, the entire world was a clinical desert just probably 150, 200 years ago, right? So how did that happen? What, and you only get that from understanding a little bit more about history. So not only the undergraduates, people just getting involved with uh, global health, the graduate students we have, most of whom are physicians or nurses or senior managers from a you know, public health bureaucracy, they're also novices around understanding con context and social history. So we give them the same advice. Yes, they're fully qualified to do whatever it is they're doing, but if they're gonna stop and try and understand something, we say the tools are at, at hand. You have to understand more about context and how that came to be. So that was a longish answer, but I may be forgiven, I think, since that's what I do for a living. And, uh, and I hope you'll think about it. You know, That's how I got to know about Sierra Leone and Liberia, not by learning the languages, but by actually doing homework. John, did you want to add anything there? I mean, I completely agree. I think it's about listening and, you know, listening carefully and trying to listen to lots of different voices and not just the, uh, not, not, yeah, I think that was it. That's it. Yeah. I, I kind of want to jump off of that theme too, because in the chat, as well as a pre-submitted question, you know, there was um, talk about, you know, how do you avoid the white savior complex, right? We are all three white people, two white men, one white woman. How do we approach the work in a way that does not have that sense? And, and Paul, you have been you know, working in this field for decades. And I thought you were gonna yeah. say, Paul, you're the whitest. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but, but John, would, would you like to, to talk a little bit about that? And, and you know, uh, another uh, commentator, Bill had said, you know, this, the issue of Western culture and imperialism, um, you know, how do you think about that when going into a developed nation? So, yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I think that cultural humility, if, 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 is that the term that you used? I really like that term. Um, you know, I, I think in general, coming from a place of listening and uh, real, true uh, accompaniment, which is about an exchange of experiences and expertises, not about a one-way direction of them, um, is really important. But if at any point, like, I think that I'm the hero of this journey, like, I need to be punched in the face. Like, I have seen the people who are the doing the work, um, and I count many of them as my friends, and I am not the important person. And if I start to think that I am, like, I, yeah, I, I need to be put in my place. So like, I, I think it's really important to be conscious of, it's really important to be aware of. Um, and it's important to be aware of the history, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, we, we have a long history of using medicine and using healthcare access as a tool of exploitation and as a tool of imperialism. And I think it's important to remember that and know that history. Paul, it was great. Thank well, you. you know, I'm just going to say, as we do when writing notes in the hospital, agree with above, you know, it's white supremacy is no joke. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it's another it, it's another thing to give uh, to be thankful for that, that we have been able to focus more in this country on the discussion of white supremacy, 
for reasons that are, are I'm sure familiar to everyone. We have a, you know, it's gonna be stupid to say we have a long way to go. But I would also say that, uh, you know, again, cultural humility, that that's kind of, you know, why I brought it up is because, you know, anytime, regardless of, uh, well, I mean, anytime I go into uh, a setting of privation and disease, you can bet I'm, you know, uh, comparatively an elite. So I don't make jokes about it, although I've been tempted to, to say, well, you know, white, con white savior complex, well, I'm white, sure enough, although my kids say I'm pink, you know, and I'm complex, and we're supposed to be saving people, right? But that's not the reason I get this question so much, not in the field, but in American universities. And almost always when I hear that question, it's not in Sierra Leone, Haiti. In, in Haiti, it's kind of a more of a, a background story that you're uh, expected to understand through cultural humility and through listening. Uh, and, and because there's a very uh, obvious uh, and brisk cultural critique of white supremacy in rural Haiti, but also class uh, supremacy. And so I got trained by the masters, the rural Haitians. And by the time, you know, you get 10 years of that training and you go somewhere else, be it Peru, a different part of the United States, Rwanda, you've been trained by the Haitians and therefore trained by the best. So I'm just saying, I have, you know, the yield on being quiet, listening, cultural humility, and doing your homework is significant in this arena as well. Thank you both. Um, I, I also want to pull back to the conversation of the Maternal Center of Excellence in Sierra Leone. We had a question that was submitted earlier. I see some other questions about maternal health in the chat. Um, is this meant to be a model and a guide for similar work elsewhere? How do you frame this project as one that's maybe repeatable in other contexts? Um, and, and John, I'm curious to hear what you think about that idea. Yeah, I mean, I think PIH has a long history of doing that. I'm not an ex, you know, I'm not an expert in how to um, repeat uh, the kinds of things that that uh, PIH has proven to the global health community that that can be repeated. But I have seen I have seen them do that over and over and over again. Um, you know, our, our desire to do this is, is partly about wanting to call attention to these inequities and to their root causes and to their long-term solutions. Um, it is also partly about wanting to use the, you know, lend the microphone, lend the amplification tools to the people who, uh, you know, have, have often been denied them. So yeah, I mean, when I when I look at it, I do. I mean, there is certainly a need, and I hope that uh, it can be replicated. But and I think part of the you know, part of the importance of this is is saying like we just we choose this world, like we choose to accept this world, and we don't have to. Like we have made choices in the past as a human community that have led to. Uh, both things getting better and things getting worse for the most marginalized and vulnerable among us. And we can make a different choice. And so I, I don't know about repeating it, um, but I, I, I do know that, you know, we can make a different choice in Kono starting today. And that's what motivates me. Paul, I'd love to hear your thoughts too about that. You know, is, is this an example of what can be done? And and also maybe to mention the value of training and education of the next yeah. generation of clinicians, because that is part of this model. Well, you know, I, I, I just want to though marvel for a second at the way the world works and what we choose to accept. You know, when we were saying, come on, you can treat MDRTB, we weren't saying, and we're going to develop the new drugs to do so. We were saying, well, why would this pres prescription for this disease be different in Lima than it is in Manhattan? You know, or when we said we could treat AIDS in Haiti and rural Africa, it wasn't like we were saying, oh, we're going to develop new diagnostics, new therapeutics, and an entire new treatment modality. We just said, uh, should there be a different therapy for AIDS in South Africa than in, you know, South Bend, Indiana? And we knew the answer already, you know? And so there's this, I, I just have to marvel, you know, when we, when we go in and repeat, what are we repeating? Well, part of what we're repeating 
is saying, I would assume that these people matter as much as I do and that they love their families as much as we do and that they relish things like cleanliness and beauty and you know, a, a life with less pain like we do. So, you know, I can keep my mouth shut. I mean, no reason to be here in a, in a meeting with you and John, but I'm saying it's a marvel though, isn't it? That, you know, we, we what do you expect? Applause, uh, that we develop some radically new treatment regimen. It's really the miracle of equity. That's the innovation. If people are looking for innovation, it would be innovative across the continent of Africa, certainly, if you want to decolonize global health, well, you could start by actually providing health services. For many, it will be for the first time. You know, colonial medicine wasn't medicine. It was a system of disease control, largely. And when it did practice medicine with, you know, things like therapies and nurses, and all, it was largely on behalf of white uh, clientele. And that's true in Sierra Leone. It's true in South Africa, you know. And so the repeating part of it is, yes, there are new things you have to learn. You know, if you go to Lesotho and there's no malaria because they're too high up in the mountains, don't have a malaria program. If you go to, you know, if you if you go to another place where everybody who wants access to family planning has it, well, then don't worry about that. But the fact is, you know, one of the ways we could do more and be better at repeating our successes is to continue to bring cultural humility, a commitment to, to uh accompaniment. And then finally, and this, this is crazy to me, it's like, we'll go to these places and people will say, I need my kids to be in school. I have a broken leg and it never healed. I'd like it to be fixed. I need a laptop and I need a cell phone. And by the way, it'd be nice to have a motorcycle or how about a tin roof rather than a thatch roof. Everywhere we go, people are resolutely materialist. They're telling us the things they need. And then we go on and talk about, well, they need to have a more, a culture more committed to health equity. Or It's not about culture as much as it is. We're living in a clinical desert and a clinical desert is almost always a food desert and a furniture desert and a TV desert, you know? So I, I think, you know, the, the real commitment to repeating and doing better every time would be given the greatest boost if we just assume that people would like some of the things that we expect in our lives. Is that too harsh? No. Too harsh. No, it makes me think about um, the, the campaigns to end chaining at the psychiatric hospital, the only psychiatric hospital in Sierra Leone where there were all these campaigns because patients would be chained to beds at night and, and sometimes throughout the day. And there were all these campaigns to end it. There were all these posters that got sent around that said uh, chaining is inhumane. And it was treated as a cultural problem, some yeah. kind of like moral or ethical failure when it was a uh, healthcare access and equity failure. Because the drug that I take to be able to survive, the psychiatric medication that I take in order to survive, um, was not available. And that was the case for every other psychiatric medication as well. Um, and, and there was no treatment. There, were, there was inadequate staffing. All of the, all the, the things that caused that shame to happen, it was our shame. It was our failure. And that, like understanding that, I think, reshaped the way that I understood it. And now at Kesey Psych Psychiatric Hospital, people are getting very good care and there is no chaining. And what changed wasn't the culture, what changed was the available resources. It's such a beautiful example, John. And anthropologists should be familiar with that too. Um, not that they would uh, fall for the, all the same traps that so many of us do, but you know, uh, if it had been a cultural problem, then why was there like hooting and clapping and joy at the unchaining on the part of the family members, the patients, the staff, the authorities, you know, like the president of the Republic is like, thank you for unchaining these people. The minister of health, thank you. The only psychiatrist in the country that day, thank you. It has nothing to do with culture. You know, when you, when you read about the civil war in Sierra Leone, it was the same story. It's like these people, and that was usually Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, they live in a violent, barbaric culture you know, no mention of slavery or the slave trades or any of the other things, neoliberalism, structural adjustment. It was the Civil War. And the Civil War was supposed to be a marker 
of barbarity. If you could see the art, and these are articles in places like the Atlantic Monthly. I mean, this is not some right-wing press outlet. You could see these claims all over. It's like, this place is hopeless, you know? No wonder they, same thing with, Af with Rwanda in 1994, you, you know? And so I just chuckled when I found an article saying that just a few years after the end of the Civil War, that Sierra Leone was judged the second most peaceful country, I think in Africa, but it could have been West Africa, and the next year, the most peaceful. So what changed? Did Sierra Leonean culture change? No, there was a ceasefire and they burned 70,000 guns. That's a material intervention. They also promised jobs programs. Uh, they also promised financial uh, you know, aid and reintegration. Now, did that stuff work very well? No, but it didn't have a lot to do with the culture. And it's the same story at Kissy, you know, it was called Kissy Lunatic, you know, for many centuries, rather. We didn't change the culture, we unlocked the chains. And we did that by giving them, the, again, the same kind of things we might expect when we have mental health derangements. We, we expect to be cared for. We expect to be able to find the, the medications if that's the therapy for it. And they couldn't have those things. So just keep doing our work and cultures do change sometimes in very positive ways. I think this is a good jumping point too for you know talking about what you should read and, and inform yourself of, right? Um, one of the questions that was pre-submitted was, what three books should people be reading? I think the framework was youth, but let's just say all of us are young and should- Well, obviously my books, so. Oh, clearly, John <laughs> and you, Green John, and you Paul can choose Farmer. The three. Search. Um, I'll, rec I'll recommend one of your books. Yes. Uh, I'll recommend uh, <laughs> Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, which is about Sierra Leone and, and Ebola and, um, and uh, the the centuries of, of impoverishment that uh, that preceded um, preceded the Ebola crisis. It's and, and it's just a great it's a great book. It's a really important overview, English language overview for um, for for people who may may not know a lot about Sierra Leonean history. Um, two other books I'd recommend. Only one more by a PIHer. Um, I. The, this, the book that changed, it's a textbook and it costs like $60, which is kind of annoying, but um, it's called An Introduction to Global Healthcare Delivery by Dr. Joya Mukherjee, who uh, works, works at PAH. And that book changed my life in a deep and ongoing way. Um, and then the last book, I always recommend this book to young people that had a huge impact on me when I was, um, when I was young and still does, and I think it's the great American novel of the 20th century, um, is Beloved by Toni Morrison. So those are the three books I'd recommend. Excellent, great choices. Paul, what do you got for us? Shoot, can I still say Beloved? Yeah. <laughs> That's, you can get a double an important book. book. It's an important book. Well, a book I was gonna mention, written by you, you told me that you didn't like it, so I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I Beloved is a good example because I don't know, I think I, I would choose fiction. And, you know, because uh, I've already told you, I regard the rest of that as homework, right? And, I mean, for myself and for you. I did see a note in the chat. No, we're high school students or we can't read 500 page books, but that was actually from the teacher and I know him very well and his students do read 500 page books. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, um, I would say this and I'm sorry to be, to be vague, part of it because I'm looking around at my desk and seeing books by students of mine like this one, which is relevant. It's by Luke Messick, uh, who is a now an emergency uh, medicine resident, did an MD, PhD. I was his undergraduate professor. This is a history of, Colonial medicine, <clears throat> colonial medicine in Malawi. And, you know, it happens to be on, on my desk here. I mean, actually in the Navajo room, so I'm not at my own desk. But I would, I would uh, think of some of those homework books and, and, and force yourself to do it. Um, I'm actually trying to read some uh, theology right now, and let's just say it's not going so well yet. Well, I love the healthy mix here of, of great books to, to read. You know, it's the holiday season, so why not? And by um, the way, Claire G, who has a, a British spelling of Claire, I'm guessing, and uh, 
uses the English pound side, but abandoned. She mentions the Joya's book is available to use, but it's coming out in paper. It's just out in paperback. So great. Yeah, I know. I know Claire G, uh, and she is a huge supporter of the Maternal Center of Excellence. So hi, hi, Claire. Hey, Claire. I hope to see you uh, in London someday soon, if I can ever travel again. <laughs> Uh, one last question, because I can't believe how quickly this time has flown. It's really been a great chat. Um, but uh, one question that was pre-submitted, how do you convince other people in the beginning of your journey to join you? And I think this can be something, Paul, you know, back in the beginning, right, of Partners in Health and John and in, in your adventure too, along with us, to um, talk about some of these things that maybe people had never even heard of or thought about didn't know where Sierra Leone was possibly on the map. So um, I'd love to, to, John, maybe give you the mic first and then sure. Paul. You know, the thing that had the biggest impact on me when I was starting out and that I think has had an impact on other people when I've, I've shared it with them is that, you know, when, when I had a book that became very successful called The Fault in Our Stars and when it uh -huh. became- Well, see, I could have said it, John. <laughs> when, it, when it became successful, you know, our, our initial- Sarah and I's initial idea was that we would uh, like build up the money into a huge charitable trust. And then when it got, and it would grow and grow and grow. And, um, and then it would be really, really big when it was done growing. It was a sort of a vague outcome in our minds. And then once it was really big and it had grown a lot, we could do so much good with it. And what I had to come to understand, or I, I mean, I think, I think ultimately what Sarah had to pull me to understand was that if we gave away the money now, if we found good uses for the money now, it would still grow. It would just grow outside of our control. It would grow in the form of more people surviving childbirth. It would grow in the form of more kids surviving to adulthood. It would grow in the form of fewer kids suffering from malnutrition, fewer kids dying of diseases like tuberculosis. And that insight that the money is growing, it's just growing away from us in ways that are far more impactful than anything that the stock market can do, was the insight that really helped me act now instead of waiting for some you know, outside idea of what constitutes a, a big gift. Yeah. Thank you, John and, and Paul. Uh, yeah. Well, let me just day, say, this is not a problem I have faced very often in my life, John. <laughs> my uh, bestsellers like Infections and Inequalities just rack up these huge royalties that I, I have all of them. Um, I'm doing I my part. <laughs> <laughs> I Leslie, what was the rephrase the question for? Yeah. So you know, when you're when you're starting out on on what maybe to others uh, an interesting or crazy journey right you know an, an interesting journey that's new like partners in health how do you convince people to come along for the ride or or whatever the project might be right that other naysayers might not agree with but you know, you know. it's first of all what about this journey is not interesting nothing it's all interesting what about it's not fun well there are some things that really are not fun at all but uh, they are usually, even in the middle of responding, I mean, maybe I have one experience and that was the earthquake of 2010, where I thought if I could never remember any of this, it would be okay by me. But that wasn't the case with fighting Ebola or cholera or the last earthquake. So it's not only interesting, it's very satisfying. And, 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 and then finally, uh, where are you gonna meet more interesting and nicer people than the people who would like, I, if there are 1200 people who signed up uh, for this session, Leslie, uh, I could just say this, you found a town with those 1200 people in there and I'd happily live there because I like the people that are drawn to this. And I'm not just talking about the physicians and nurses, I'm talking about you know, our interlocutors, sometimes there are donors, sometimes, sometimes there are critics. I mean, you know, I, I know a whole rock band because Arcade Fire has spent years and years supporting partners and help. They're my personal friends, but I met them because of the work, you know, and that happens again and again and again. And for that to happening, happen now so much, I'm 62, 
to me, that's another reminder. There are lots of reasons to come along this journey. And it's not that I said so. You know, I've followed other people on their journey, global health journeys. So it's fun, it's instructive, or it's often enough fun. It's instructive, it's terribly moving, it satisfies you, it's satisfying, and it brings you in contact with wonderful people. I mean, how else would I have met John Green? And that's a great way to wrap this up because this was just a, a wonderful conversation on Giving Tuesday, the best of all holidays. So if, <laughs> if you don't mind, and if you haven't yet, consider giving to PIH.org. You'll definitely find an opportunity or PIH Canada if you are listening from Canada. Um, and I saw someone in the comments, Paul, say, where can we interrogate Paul more? You can interrogate him this Thursday <laughs> on Reddit, Ask Me Anything. Oh, I'm doing yeah. that Thursday? I'll yep. be there. I'll be there, Paul. Thursday. Gonna, All right, I just want to point I, out that I'm I think be it was tons Taylor. of questions. All right, I think it was Taylor. I don't know if I can go back to the Taylor said something really sweet to us. Uh, wait, let me, it's so good. I needed cool. it that we're not like, oh, I can't find it anymore, but we're, we're really hip. Nice white guys, John. So thank you, Taylor. You're rock thank star you, Taylor Hazan. of your own making. And um, so thank you each of you, John and Paul, for spending the entire hour with us. Thank you, everyone who's listening and watching. Donate if you can. Follow us. Uh, we're all over the place on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we also have a TikTok account. Um, definitely get on with the blog brothers and nerd fighters. Um, and someone did wonder if we have an, uh, an account for MCOE in Sierra Leone, just follow PIH Sierra Leone on, um, on Instagram, you'll find them. So um, thanks so much, everyone. Happy Giving Tuesday to you all and have a great rest of your week. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank great you, John. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Uh, take care.